Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and the fact that, so for example, us, the PhD lasts for three years and a half to four years. Right? So, so when the student is kind of ready to be like self yeah. propelled yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and, and yeah. ready, yeah. they have to write up. Yeah. And, and here you can extend it, at you least for one yeah, more year. At right? least for a year. Yeah, exactly. That's the that's the nice thing about that. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, give uh, it a couple more minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. And the crowd here is mostly grass. Yeah. It's all yeah, it's mostly grass students. Uh, you'd be amazed at how much you can in the sense that, you know, there's grass but there's gonna be all over the you change the department, they're kind of all over. Mm. But they all have some affiliation with grass, either in the Robo MIT or something. What's the ratio between international and national? Uh, About like, grad, yeah. 50, 50, 50, 50, 50, 50. Okay. I know we have, at least the last I checked, it was over 50% mm -hmm. domestic. And so do, but I don't know how much above 50%. We have a good amount of domestic students. Yeah. And, and I would say a lot of the top PhD programs in the, in the country here is still predominantly, you know, it's more than 50% domestic students. And it's only when you sort of start, you know, going down the, the, the universities that are the rankings that you see the mm -hmm. international students. And then this, you know, those would be um, from India to China. Yeah. Let's get started. Okay, let's get started. Thanks for coming. Um, so it's a great pleasure for us to have uh, Fabio Ramos, who's a professor in computer science from the University of Sydney. Um, so part of the reason why we were able to get him is because he's actually doing a sabbatical and at NVIDIA in Seattle, Washington. So it's great to have you here. Um, so a couple of factoids. I don't even think you know about this, right? So, so Fabio and I kind of sort of had very similar career trajectories, except we were almost like, um, you know, literally on opposite sides of the world. So um, I was, we were in Brazil in high school, but we were, you know, probably in the same city. But then uh, you did your undergrad at University of Sao Paulo, while I did my undergrad um, here in Philadelphia, or you know. Swarthmore, and then um, you got your PhD um, in Sydney, right, with um, Hugh Duran White. And so, Paulo, I'm uh, sorry, so Fabio actually has a connection with Grass because his PhD advisor was a Grass Bee um, and was, you know, worked with uh, Max Mintz. And then, so you graduated from Sydney, and you, so you and I actually graduated about the same time. Uh -huh. And so, so you stayed in Sydney, and then I stayed in Philadelphia. <laughs> so, um, but this is what is really cool, is that Fabio has been talking about say, spatial temporal processes, right? Um, even before I knew what the term spatial uh, temporal processes actually meant. Um, so it is a great pleasure uh, for us to have him here. And, you know, so Fabio is the director of the Center for Translational uh, Data Science, 
at a University of Sydney. Um, he has you know, multiple awards, best paper awards. Uh, what is you know, really unique is he also has not just one, uh, but actually two Google publication prize, right? Um, and as well as uh, you know, being advisor of the year um, <laughs> award. So, um, it's, so without any further ado, I'm gonna let Fabio take the stage and sort of uh, please welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Annie, for the introduction. It's uh, great to be here. Uh, uh, and the connection is actually even further because my master's supervisor, Fabio Cosmo, he was a student of Eric Krotov, who is also from here. <laughs> so it's like coming back to, uh, 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 is it, to uh, old, you know, the, to, to the origins uh, uh, where uh, uh, everything started. So it's great to be here. Uh, look, uh, before I, I, I get into my, uh, my stuff, uh, uh, I promise Dieter just to show you a couple of slides of the uh, new lab, the new uh, NVIDIA lab, where uh, uh, you know, we, we are accepting I interns and, and uh, uh, we are building this lab as, as we speak, right? So <laughs> just to give you an idea, so it's a lab uh, uh, close to University of Washington in, in the sunny uh, Seattle, right? Uh, there's very little rain there. And it's supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, when we are full staff, it will be 20 kind of research staff uh, uh, and 50 roboticists, so including 20 to 25 interns plus visiting staff like myself and so on. And really the focus of the lab, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting model because what we have there is a kitchen. So it's a kitchen. Looks like a kitchen, uh, it's an IKEA kitchen, where we got the models from IKEA. We have a simulated kitchen uh, integrated into NVIDIA simulators and, and so on. And what we try to do is really create a benchmark for robotic research in, uh, uh, you know, in that kind of environment where we want to study the relationship, you know, human robotics, robotics interaction, perception of objects, all, all these things. So, we started not long ago, but uh, this is a, a kind of a, a little uh, a demo of something we showed to uh, NVIDIA CEO. The opening of the lab was a couple of uh, weeks ago, and it shows a bit of the integration of, this, uh, uh, of, of all the perception and control and so on to do tasks like, uh, you know, storing things inside cabinets. So, uh, you know, the arm has to or well, the robot has to identify where things are, get the 3D pose of this stuff, opening the cabinets and put stuff in there. So the idea is that in a couple of years' time, I, I, I will take my, my, my son there, he'll make a total mess, and then I call the robot, and the robot will store everything for us, right? It'll clean up the, the, the kitchen. And maybe we'll do a few other things with, uh, you know, uh, feeding people uh, that have some disabilities and, and things like that. But it's, uh, and, uh, and the idea is to make this very open. So uh, the, we will provide the simulators. If people want to, you know, test their algorithms in that kind of environment. And you can even kind of rent the, the, the place uh, for free for a specific amount of time to run the stuff on, on, on the physical robot. So it's a, it should be a, a very exciting. Okay, so Dieter will be happy with me that uh, I showed this stuff to you, and it's a, and it's a, it's a great initiative. And, and thanks, Nvidia, for creating this uh, the, uh, this vision. Okay, so um, let's uh, uh, now go back uh, a few years, uh, uh, back to 2007, where uh, uh, basically a lot of this stuff I'm going to show today is motivated by this project, right? So that's uh, 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 that's. Australia, if you haven't seen that, it's down there, down under. And this is the middle of nowhere, really, right? It takes uh, 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 four to five hours to get there, multiple uh, uh, flights and, and so on. You can land in a helicopter in a place like this. This is an iron, iron ore mine, right? And here's the idea, right? You, uh, you want to get the minerals, the iron, f removed from the ground with the appropriate quality. Uh, uh, crush that material to a level, to the size that is reasonable, that it gives you premium value, and you uh, uh, ship that to China, where they are building uh, stuff and, and so on. And a big mining company came to us and said, look, I would like to automate all of this stuff. 
and you have 10 years to do so, and here's some money, uh, go and do it. I said, okay, so, uh, um, right, so how do I go about starting on this? So what should I do? First, uh, uh, we look at this process, and you see there's multiple machines. I think the, the, the smallest one is probably this drill. It's about 80 tons, right? So uh, big toys for us. And we, we look at this problem and say, look, it's, it's large. Um, we don't have an understanding of the stuff underground, which is, you know, if you go to a, to a, a, a tire factory or something, and you go to a warehouse, you can count how many tires you have there. There you have that precisely. If you are in a problem like this, your product is underground, you don't have a precise observability of the amount uh, 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 of this stuff in there. So the first thing we did was we, we, we uh, uh, went to this piece of equipment, it's a drill rig, and start automating it. So the drill rig make this uh, 15 meters holes where uh, each hole we can fill it up with about 200 kilograms of explosives. And then we fire about 100 to 200 of these holes almost at the same time to create a shock wave and, and break the rocks and, 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 and you know, you can feel the, the ground shaking. It's actually very fun to trigger that explosion, right? Uh, um, but after this is done, uh, you, uh, uh, you want to start assessing the quality of the material in there. And the drill was the first machine we automated, not because it is boring to drill and have an operator in there, but it's the first time you get in contact with the rocks. It's the first time that we can look at the, uh, 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 you know, the vibration and the measurements that come from that drill rig to then start making a picture of the material uh, uh, underground. So it was the information that comes from that particular piece of equipment that led us to automate it first. Um, but the problem is a really wonderful statistical problem, right? Uh, 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 and it also makes us, uh, uh, you know, uh, play with uh, uh, big toys. So it, it didn't take too long for us to realize that uh, uh, things can be a bit dangerous. So, you, you know, you have your PhD students there, you say, let's test object recognition, right, uh, uh, from a radar. And, you know, there's some bits of dust coming, uh, and then, uh, you know, it just happened that a bit of dust is just going in front of the radar, and, and, and then you get this uh, uh, sandwich, right? Uh, in this case, it was just, uh, you know, it was fun to do, uh, um, but it's to say that things are tricky. You can't just rely on your uh, deep neural net, and if it fails, uh, uh, you, you don't have answers. We have to be very precise in trying to understand all the aspects uh, of failure cases and so on. Because even though this case was, uh, obviously the student didn't finish the PhD in there, but, but there are cases where people effectively you know, uh, lost lives and, 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 uh, uh, and triggered big uh, uh, issues for the company. And, and you know, so, so in this case, who on earth would put a rock this size on top of the truck, right? And that happens because if you have this excavator, huge things and, and, and dust everywhere, sometimes they can't even see what they are uh, loading their stuff on. So you have to be robust. And to be robust, uh, uh, I, you know, I tell my students that to be robust, you need to understand what you don't know. So understanding what you know, it might be easy, but understanding what you don't know, it's much harder. So I always tell them when they start a PhD that it's better to be imprecisely right than precisely wrong, right? And that sentence guided a lot of my research in, uh, uh, in the following years, right? So I tell you, uh, 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 this little animation tells you the complex of the problem, right? So we are trying to understand this uh, middle layer kind of orange stuff down in there. If we make an error of, uh, you know, 1% in the quality up or, or you know, uh, uh, more or less, it's uh, $100,000 actually you lose for more or less a volume of, of this. So you have to be precise and, and you don't observe that. So what we do is we try to interpolate and create statistical models that leverage information coming from these holes, integrate them to then produce these nice surfaces. Okay, 
and, uh, uh, and assessing the uncertainty is absolutely critical uh, for this problem. So we start with the drill for that reason. But it turns out that over the years, the stuff that we develop for uh, 2D is also important for things like 3D. So, uh, for example, this is uh, uh, air pollution in the U.S., where uh, uh, we measure pollution in these uh, uh, blue uh, crosses in there. And, uh, uh, and we want to integrate now in time and space, right? Because, well, things vary differently in space, as you see, uh, as you see in here. So, you know, this is time, and that, that's the term temporal pattern for uh, uh, pollution in, in that particular place. And that's another one. But there are statistical dependence that happen everywhere. And, and guess what? You want to assess the pollution, not only where you have a pollution sensor, but you want to assess pollution everywhere. You want to create something that is continuous, that predicts in the future, and so on. So for us, it was very important to integrate and create continuous models, things that interpolate and extrapolate over the future. Right? So with this in mind, uh, what I want to uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, talk to you about is uh, uh, about this, these challenges for us. Right? So half of this talk is, will be mostly on the perception side, and then uh, the other half on the planning. This is also important that uh, uh, if you have problems in space and time, collecting the right piece of information at the right time, at the right space, is absolutely critical. Uh, for us. So how to, uh, 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 to be robust in modeling space and time problems, how to fuse information from multiple sources, and how to deal with these large quantities of information that usually arrive for us you know, as a streaming, streaming problem. A a and obviously a plan in this uh, scenario. Let's, let's go back to basics, right? So I, I love this uh, uh, little animation here. Uh, and that tells you a lot about the nature of uncertainty and why it's important to understand the gray region in this uh, picture. So let me tell you what's going on in here. So I'm just doing a normal regression problem, stuff that you see in Statistical 101, right? Uh, um, and uh, uh, um, let me pause around here. And you are given these uh, red uh, uh, crosses. The true function is the dash red function here, okay? And the blue line is my uh, estimate for what I think it is. What you see in the uh, uh, plot underneath is the objective. So that's an objective function that I'm going to try to maximize with respect to the parameters of the function at the top and get a, a good estimate for this, uh, uh, you know, this dash red function here. So let's see what happens when I optimize this. So I go from one explanation of the data, which was just that very simple uh, uh, flat line, to this other explanation of the data in the other extreme, where now the model understands that, well, the best fit is the blue line, which passes exactly through the data points. Now let me give you a bit of understanding for what's going on in here. So if you have a model that is uh, uh, overly complex and believes that your measurements are all correct, you have a phenomenon, something really bad, and that is called overfit. Yes, right. So that side of the graph is showing a typical overfitting problem. But it's enough for us to uh, uh, just see some of the properties and some of the things that are happening with these uncertainties here. So the first thing is, let's look at areas where we have data points. So for example, this, this area here. There is still some residual kind of uncertainty in that area, even though I have data points, right? So that uncertainty is basically due to some noise or my, uh, 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 let's say, uh, my lack of uh, uh, ability to measure the, 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 the process correctly. So it's a noise kind of term. This is the uncertainty due to the measuring factor. It is due to your uh, you know, sensor model, if you wish. Then we go to regions where you don't have that much data point. So let's say this region here, where the uncertainty grows as well. Grows a lot, actually. Even though my mean estimate, which is the blue line here, is very off, 
the behavior of the function is relatively, you know, it's within my, let's say, my, my error rate, right? It's within that, 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 that region. And this uncertainty, which is called the epistemic uncertainty, is my inability to actually model the process, it comes from my model and so on, is absolutely critical in many of the problems I'm gonna show and is important for planning and, and many other things, right? Because it is, well, when I don't have data points, the uncertainty should grow, obviously. So you wanna collect more data there, that's super important. And many problems, many, many models that people use these days don't have that feature. And you see that that has uh, uh, some uh, negative impact when you wanna do the, uh, uh, you know, when you wanna uh, uh, optimize things and so on. So obviously the best uh, solution happens uh, 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 as a compromise between these two possible explanations, which is given by this, uh, 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 you know, by, by the fit, this, this fit in here, where the epistemic uncertainty and the noise uncertainty is more or less well behaved, but it's not too complex, it's not too simple, it's just the right thing. And what you see in here is uh, type two maximum likelihood or marginal likelihood, right? So I'm optimizing with respect to this marginal likelihood and has this uh, uh, interpolation property in terms of complexity. Okay, so that's a very important uh, point, the nature of uncertainty and the types of uncertainty that will guide us through the, uh, us through the process. Now, the other thing I was very keen since the beginning was in many problems, you do have some prior understanding of the phenomenon. And you'd like to encode, to force, uh, that this prior knowledge is somehow followed. So for example, if I know that I'm dealing with finance, I know that the functions I'm being, uh, I would like to interpolate are very uh, kind of uh, uh, you know, sharp, right? So wiggly and going up and down, there's a chaotic systems in there. I would like to say, well, I would like to have a solution that encodes that type of behavior, right? Uh, um, so it's a space of functions, actually, that I would like to uh, uh, use. Um, so the way we address many of these problems, and you see uh, as we go on, is to uh, um, think about machine learning where I'm looking at this space of functions that have some type of behavior or property that I would like to have. Then I condition that on, on, the, on, on the data that I collect. And then I get a solution. So for example, if I would like to see, so these are samples, you know, functions, sample, Function is just like an infinite data point, sample from that space. And I, let's say I would like them to be smooth. I can condition on the data that I observe these things here, and that will give me this explanation. So adds the prior information, right? So the, the properties I want are already clamped in there, plus the data to give me the, 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 the solution I want. And this is possible if you define spaces where these functions should live. These spaces, you can pick one type of space, you know, the dot product space, in which case you have uh, uh, Hubert spaces. And, and, and as you're gonna see, the definition of a Hubert space uh, uh, relies on the definition of, of a kernel, right? Picking kernel functions, which is uh, uh, something that uh, uh, we've been uh, working quite a lot. So these are some types of kernels or Hubert spaces that you can uh, uh, select, and, and there are, you know, uh, beautiful kind of uh, uh, solutions for those. Uh, the, the fin for finance, for example, you can, you can have functions like this. This is, is called, the, uh, it's called the matern half, right? Uh, and you give you solutions like this, but look at this one. It's a neural network, uh, right? This type of function, Hubert space, is equivalent of having a neural net as your kernel, a neural net with one hidden layer where the number of neurons in that hidden layer is infinite. That was a result achieved by Redford, Neil, and, and Chris Williams you know, in the early 90s that really brought non-parametric statistics with neural networks and combined them together. It's a wonderful paper. You should take, take, take a look at that. Uh, but it shows this property, right? Neural networks can even be incorporated into this framework. And so some, some people are even looking at multi layer, uh, multiple hidden layers, and defining kernels that have the property of some deep neural networks in there. So it's the, these are not orthogonal things. I think that's the message I'm gonna say. They are not orthogonal things. The, the, playing with kernels and looking at functional analysis, it's actually a solid background to then take a, 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 
uh, deep net to, to a more theoretical level and giving prize and so on. Okay, so I mentioned to you the, na the nature of uncertainty and how important that is, uh, uh, and the uh, fact that is very important for us in many cases to get priors and, 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 and provide solutions that follow the, uh, the intuition, like solutions and, and space of functions that have that particular behavior. Let me show you an example now, okay, in, in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the mines, uh, uh, in, in that original problem in ion ore mining, where uh, we had, uh, um, uh, we ask surveyors to walk in that uh, mine with uh, uh, GPS antennas in their heads and, and picking data points. Uh, so we get this point cloud here, it's, it's just noisy GPS locations, and, and this, you can see this as a kind of big hole in the ground as the mine gets uh, excavated and so on. These are laser scanners. Uh, another laser scanner, you see that, uh, in, for example, here, the laser scanner was in a different position, so you have occlusions, but the laser scanner is much more precise, it's correctly localized and so on. And following this, essentially, the, 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 the framework that I described, marginal likelihoods and picking priors, and would like these functions to be sharp, we can then obviously put these things together, just you know, combining the same uh, framework, uh, the, the same coordinate system, but then producing models that are just like that, right? So where you have the sharpness you want to model these uh, uh, these edges, and uh, 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 and the surfaces uh, you want, but you have uncertainties everywhere. So trucks can drive in this thing. Right, uh, uh, and if you think that that area is not particularly well uh, 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 represented, the uncertainty is high, you can get more data from that thing, and this mining process evolves to something that is way more uh, uh, powerful and robust. It turns out that you can do uh, even more than just uh, mine, right? So let me go into more of the robotics uh, uh, representations uh, uh, in here. So. My uh, uh, very uh, uh, good friend, old friend, uh, uh, Albert Elfes, uh, uh, who maybe he was from GRASP, or maybe he was from CMU, it's one of the two. Uh, uh, he, he's Brazilian, right? So also a Corinthians kind of supporter in soccer. Uh, 25, 25 years ago, he came up with this thing called occupancy grids, right? You learned that during your uh, masters or, or whatever, which is a great technique, super simple. You, you, you break the world into these little uh, 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 tiles and, uh, and boxes, and, and then you treat each cell independently, and it's occupied or non-occupied, and you have this uh, uh, probability and, and, and so on. Right, and we said, okay, uh, uh, Alberto, after 25 years, maybe we can do something, and, and, and looking at the motivation I showed before, maybe we can provide some different models that might be useful for you. And, and maybe alleviate some of the problems here. So for example, if you drive and you collect this data, so that's uh, uh, like laser returns, and you produce an occupancy maps that looks like this. And you know, it doesn't take much to say, look, it's probably, I should probably fill this gap here. It could probably interpolate that region, right? So, that, and if I treat cells independently, I don't have the statistical the, the, the dependence, the statistical dependence to actually be able to do that. So you can produce uh, uh, grid maps that are all going to look like this. So here's the, 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 uh, the insight, right? We can treat problems like this as a supervised learning problem where uh, I have my measurements. I want to try to infer the uh, occupancy level for a new data point that I haven't looked at. I have laser returns, and I can say, well, whenever the laser is returning, that's an occupied point and everything in this line is uh, unoccupied. So I can bring this data in and, uh, uh, and then define a statistical model on that. So one of the things you could do is, let's put a, a, a process on this, right? So, uh, and a classifier. It turns out that this relatively simple framework works well in capturing the dependence of the data, as you're gonna see. So this is a fully continuous representation it uh, uh, extrapolates well in the region, and you see uh, uh, what it can provide. So for the same, the same kind of data here, it can provide answers that are like this, where you, you see the interpolation properties of this model going through the here, 
and how the uncertainty, you know, how the walls in that kind of diffuse as I don't have data in that particular region, right? So it turns out that this model was very useful because I can, because it's continuous. If I need to, you know, if I want to do path planning and, and I don't need very sharp solutions, I can sample that model, just query the model in very sparse locations and I still get a nice uh, a representation, but sufficient for me. So uh, a few examples, driving around these two blocks, collecting a data set that looks like this, and I can provide a map that looks like this, where you see this road here, right in the middle, right here. It's now interpolated nicely just by learning the statistical dependencies that came through that. Okay, so learning the statistical dependencies is one of the most important things for us. But a major problem of this particular technique is that, well, it relies on this very expensive kind of kernel machines that, you know, require the inversion of a big grand matrix that is expensive and so on. Can we do something better? Can we do something that allow us to interpolate and create maps in space and time in streaming data where we get a data point, we do a few operations on that with that data point, update the model and move on. A couple of years ago, we, uh, uh, we uh, uh, looked into this problem and, and, and uh, uh, we uh, came up with this uh, uh, type of modeling technique it's called Hubert Maps, uh, which is essentially a, somehow approximation of a non-parametric model, like a GP model, uh, uh, that borrows a lot of these statistical dependencies, but it's fast. So everything I do here is I get a data point, I do some updates on the model, and move on. I'll tell you how it works, but you see how fast it is in updating the map and going around and learning this uh, Intel data set, right? So I get the data here. As I said, it's a, 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 it's a, it's a supervised kind of problem. Occupied versus non-occupied, okay? And I'm gonna apply some feature mapping. More on the feature mapping next, okay? But just assume I have some feature mapping. I plug that feature mapping into a, the simplest possible classifier you've learned but also something that provides some uncertainty. Let's say logistic regression. I plug some objective function in there, and I use some of the uh, you know, properties of stochastic gradient and, uh, uh, and, and some of the conversions of stochastic gradient. And I have this stuff. So it's a you know, building blocks, putting these things together. Not too complicated, right? Uh, yep, Costas. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I, I gonna, uh, this is one type of features. I'm gonna describe a few other features, right? Uh, um, and, and the reason for, uh, for this feature is because it approximates a particular type of functions, function space that I was keen on to have in there, right? M more than, it, than the uh, invariance, uh, right? But more, more on that coming, right? <laughs> so, uh, um, Here's the idea for this stuff to work, right? So I, I told you that it's always good to pick a functional space where I like to, you know, input some type of prior. But that might be an infinite space, right? So, you know, it, it might be a, an infinite feature space. Uh, one thing you can do is use this, uh, uh, this idea from, from uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, Ali and Benjamin Rich, uh, uh, where you want to approximate an infinite Hubert space with a finite feature representation. And how do you do it? Use some results in stats from the 60s. This is called the Boschner theorem that says the following. If you have a translational invariant kernel, let's say any shift invariant kernel, also called stationary, right? You can take the Fourier transform of that thing and the Fourier transform of that thing gives you, a, it can be written as this thing, where k is your original kernel as a function of tau, so that's the distance between the two data points, and this s is your kernel in the spectrum representation. So it's essentially a kernel on the spectral domain of k, right? And k is the uh, original kernel, right? So these are Fourier duals, okay? I'm just essentially applying the Fourier transform two kernels. 
When you do that, so you see that that equation is the same as the expectation with respect to the, uh, the exponential here uh, uh, and these uh, frequencies, right? These frequencies as S. That, that's the, the kernel defined over frequency. If you have that expectation, one thing you could do is approximate an integral by a, you know, a MC, kind of a Monte Carlo thing. So you go from an integral to a sum, and you can break this down, apply the uh, uh, Euler uh, uh, equation, which gives you this feature representation here, where S, this S, are essentially frequencies sample according to, the, uh, uh, to, to this uh, uh, kernel distribution here. And it turns out that depending on how you sample S, you recover different Hilbert spaces. And that's one of the key, the key properties. So for example, well, and what we are doing is essentially mapping the original space to a much higher dimensional space. But for example, the, the RBF kernel, right? Uh, 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 differentiable, uh, infinite differentiable, is nothing else than sampling from a, a, a Gaussian distribution. Uh, 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 where, uh, you know, if you don't care about the complex terms, that exponential uh, uh, complex can, can be reduced just to uh, cosines, for example, and you have that, right? Uh, but depending on how you sample, so if it's Gaussian is one type of kernel, so student T is another type of kernel, and so on. We, we have a recent paper at AI Stats where we model that, this thing, over the quantile, and we can even learn the type of kernel just by going through the quantile function, okay? Uh, uh, if you are curious about that, I, I can describe that later. So that's good. So we can, we can essentially bring in any, uh, any uh, uh, shift invariant kernel uh, uh, to here and learn these things. And, and uh, uh, so for example, this is some results on uh, the Freiburg data set where again, the codes for this uh, uh, map is, is super simple. It's, five, six lines of Python codes, and, 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 and you, you start putting the data in, uh, 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 update the gradients, you know, the parameters of that with, with stochastic gradient, and, and infer the map, you know, sample the map, and sample again, and, and you see how it updates the, uh, the process, go back to, see, uh, uh, to the same region, updates that, and, and so on, right? So uh, at the end, you recover maps that are fairly decent, but they are super compact. Because the, usually we need maybe 5,000 at most features to represent this space. Uh, and it's a very relatively large space. So I can share this map, just, you know, this is 5,000 parameters, which I can share with another robot, uh, uh, communicate, it's just 5,000 numbers and so on. So it's a very compact representation of space that people can use effectively to planning uh, uh, and other things, right? And uh, uh, since these are functions now, right? So it's a logistic regression with a particular type of kernel in there. I could try to play with different functions. So let's say now one function is a map like this. The other function is, let's say, a smaller map or just a filter with a particular structure. And this is uh, 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 some work that we presented in Coral this year um, where Hopefully this will play. I'm essentially doing a continuous convolution of these two functions. And what is highlighted there are the response of that convolution, right? Just to, to show you that if I have a, you know, a surface that looks like this, that's my filter right here, and I'm convolving that with the map, that's where the response is. And that convolution can be computed very quickly uh, um, with this, uh, uh, if you pick the right kernels. Uh, we don't do uh, uh, rotations in here. That's why I found uh, uh, wonderful the, the, the stuff you show me, because, because I think I can plug this stuff <laughs> into that. And, uh, but you see that the idea is we now have continuous convolutions, and we can even build a few layers of continuous convolutions on top of each other, and you have your deep network with continuous convolutions in there. Right? Uh, you can take that outside and, and use, you know, let's say with stereo, so this is super scalable, that's some stereo uh, uh, maps. Uh, uh, and this is the model, which has just a few, you know, a few thousand parameters as, as opposed to, I don't know how many million data points we had in there. And I can communicate and you can, inter you know, interpolate other things like color and, and, and so on. Okay? So, 
This is what I have in terms of perception. And uh, I might just pause here and ask if you have any questions before I move on to planning in these models, where you see the connection between uncertainty, space modeling, and where to get the next uh, data point. Is there any question here so far? Here. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So uh, uh, this one is, a, I'm just convolving these two functions. And, and just to show that, well, first I can do that efficiently. Uh, in the paper you see there is, there is some uh, approximations to reduce the number of components and, and things like that. But um, yeah, it's essentially matching. I'm just convolving one with the other. And uh, doing that in translation only. So it's no rotation happening in here. We, we haven't tried that with, uh, you know, uh, uh, objects and, and complicated objects with, uh, with different types of symmetries and, and things like that. It was mostly for, uh, um, it was mostly for uh, complete, you know, completing the map and so on. I also have a, a work where we try to complete, there was RSS 17, we tried to com complete parts of cars, the, or, or, or objects that we've seen in other maps. And, and when you do this kind of convolution, it, it recovers that. I think, yes, yeah, so uh, you could do kind of kid, kidnapped robotics uh, problem. Yeah, yeah, you could do that with this. We, we, the experiments in the paper are precisely on, 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 this, on, on this problem. Okay, so uh, now what do you do with all of this space representation and, and so on, and how do you make decisions effectively where, where you get new data points and so on, and that's the, the second part of, uh, of this talk. We're going to uh, uh, build a, a, a kind of planning, a decision-making mechanism on top of a concept or, or a technique that is perhaps 30 years old, but it has seen some, uh, uh, you know, some revival uh, recently, right? It's, it's called Bayesian optimization. And, and the reason I, I, I like this thing is, uh, is because, well, uh, this is kind of statistical response to genetic algorithms, right? So, so it's, uh, uh, we have bounds for this. We can make claims about optimality, or at least conversions and, and things like that. And here's the idea, right? Suppose I have a, a black box function. I don't have access to that function. I want to optimize, find the maximum of that function. I can only sample from it, but I don't have the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the analytical form of, of, of that function. What this technique does is it builds a kind of surrogate statistical model for the objective function. At the same time, it tries to maximize it. So the idea is uh, uh, the model is more accurate in areas where the objective function I'm trying to maximize is uh, around its maximum, as you're going to see. Right? And that has a lot of implications for us, and you're going to see that next. But here's the, uh, here's the, the, the insight. Suppose I, uh, this is my function that I'm going to try to, uh, uh, to model. right? I'm trying to maximize this function, and I just query the function here and here. You query these two data points, you get the answer, you sample the function, get the value. I can then uh, uh, put a model on it, so that's a model in there. And this is the uncertainty, right? So it's a model that has uncertainty. I can define something which is called acquisition function that is a compromise between finding the maximum of that function and sampling the function in areas where I haven't sampled before. So it's almost like exploration, you know, uh, uh, exploration exploitation kind of trade-off. But it's a lot of history on which acquisition function you can pick in statistics and the properties and, and, and so on. So suppose that this is the acquisition function, uh, and this acquisition function I do have an analytical form, I can optimize and I find this maximum. Then I sample my real objective function again, get another data point, compute the acquisition function again, which tells me to sample in this other location, get another data point, and as you go in the process, you get a nice model around the maximum of that function, okay? And you have statistical guarantees and, and so on. The acquisition functions you can pick, there are 
several uh, uh, options, and they all play with this trade-off between maxi, uh, you know, exploitation and exploration. So there's probability of improvement, expected improvement, and upper confident bounds, where it might not be the most sophisticated one. So mu is the value of the function you're trying to maximize. Sigma is kind of the uncertainty. This is just a, you know, a, a, a kind of linear relationship between them. But you have more uh, uh, theoretical results for the uh, uh, UCB. That's some of the acquisition functions. They have different properties, as you see in the graph in there. You can even put penalties on these. You can plan things, say, well, I cannot sample the function too far away from me for navigating. So you can add constraints and things like that on the acquisition function. And many of the properties, convergence properties, will follow. It doesn't matter how you pick the acquisition function. Okay? Um, Here's a, a, an example where I'm trying to minimize this function. As you see, uh, I, uh, you know, we get some decent model of the function around this area. Keep on sampling, but now, since I got a good model, we sample uh, elsewhere. Here's the acquisition function you see. Then I get another data point in here. So it's an iterative process. At the end, you should recover something that looks like this, which is a good model for the function I'm trying to maximize, which has the uncertainty and, and so on. So let's see what we do with this, right? And, and here's my problem. I would like to build a model of ozone concentration uh, uh, for a large area like this. And I'm kind of simulating an aircraft that can fly around in a high altitude and, and pick the ozone concentration. And, and here's the problem, right? So I can treat this as an information gain problem. Just go to areas where I haven't seen pollution and maximize information gain as we usually do, and, and that's fine. The problem is, when you are looking at properties like pollution, uh, uh, you want to be much better in areas of high pollution. You don't care areas where the pollution is too low because that's not so impactful. So just information gain might not be the right thing to maximize. I also want to look for maximums or minimums. And with this approach, we recover a much better model of the quantity. So the robot is in there. We use Bayesian optimization to tell where the robot should sample pollution next. Okay? And we are plotting here the trajectories, how much the robot moved, and, uh, 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 and, and the quality of the, uh, uh, of the answer. And this is the UCB. So that's, this is information gain. That's UCB. Right? The conventional based optimization. This is our distance penalized UCB that essentially tell, you know, respects some robotic constraints. We cannot suddenly disappear from one point and appear in another point. So it, it can travel this much. Right? So, uh, uh, and you see that in terms of RMSE, we are better, but we travel much less as well with this, uh, with this function. Similar thing for, um, uh, 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 for a robot navigating indoors. In space-time models, where uh, uh, we want to predict the luminosity, for example, so this we can actually test the stuff in the robot, and some of the trajectories. See that with uh, uh, BO uh, distant penalized UCB, you travel much less and recover a model that is uh, uh, much more accurate around the high, uh, 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 high luminosity area. Now, uh, coming back to the um, the continuous model, right? So suppose that you are doing path planning. And you want to go from uh, here to here. These are two Hilbert maps for, uh, uh, for this region, okay? uh, uh, as I showed before some of the present, uh, in the previous slides. But a nice property of these uh, Hilbert maps is that, well, you have the uncertainty over the position of the surface. And that is because your robot was uncertain when it was moving around, or your sensor was uncertain, and so on. But because it's a continuous function, I can also take gradients with respect to that surface, that uncertain surface. And because you can take gradients, you can then design functional optimiza you know, uh, optimization procedures to learn trajectories and do path planning. So what you see here is the curve that corresponds to the, let's say, the safest curve to navigate from one point to the next. Uh, 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 and, and, you know, it also has some, you know, try to be shortest and, and so on. And the same for maps that looks like this. Yeah, 
Yeah, so this function here, just because we like, this is a, 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 it's a function in a Hilbert space where we can uh, put properties of continuity or differentiability and things like that, right? This, uh, that's a nice property because uh, uh, you, know, you, you can pick what you want in terms of function. It can even be splines, right? In, in the simplest possible case, it can even be, uh, be splines, right? So uh, um, this, this, for example, are the case where uh, I'm using BO and, and these are splines and there is a, also, surprisingly enough, a corresponding kernel to B splines. So the entire B spline or spline planning can be seen again as a, as a functional analysis in a particular uh, Hubert space where now I am integrating the cost over this function. So in this particular case, I'm driving around and I would like to the trajectory itself needs to maximize an objective. So it's like, suppose that I have a function in there and I can travel for this much distance. Where in that function I should travel to maximize the quality? So I'll show you why is this important. Here's a, 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 a spatial temporal problem. Okay, spatial temporal problem, ozone concentration again. And, and here's our uh, BO framework. Here's uh, uh, information gain, gain and a random trajectory just collecting data. And what I'm doing here is I'm trying to learn the best possible model for this spatial temporal problem uh, where I want to be much better in areas of high ozone concentration. As we progress, you see that the trajectories started to, you know, they explore the space, but they start to kind of concentrate in where the peaks are. So essentially the robot automatic, automatically decides to, okay, I wanna go here or here, because that's where I think high pollution will happen, will take place, get the right data pointing there, see the quality of my assessment, and then move on to the next area. Yeah, so in this case, like as an energy, what kind of yeah, so we are optimizing over the predictive power of the model. So I, I want to assess how wrong I am about a particular prediction I made. To assess that prediction, I need to be there at the right time to check whether that prediction was correct or not. But once I check that it's predicted, I can use that data point to improve the model. So it's a continuous kind of update model where I get better as I log the, new, the, the next data point and so on. It's not a dynamic program. It's not a dynamic program in, in the way. It's, it's based on optimization in that sense, in space and time, right? Uh, uh, and uh, it turns out that you can extend that framework to solve uh, continuous kind of uh, poundy piece. Uh, 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 where each of these kind of slice here is a type of BO, where you keep on, uh, on, on uh, you know, maximizing or integrating over multiple steps ahead and uh, in, in this continuous space-time domain, right? So uh, there is a strong relationship with PoundDP. So just because of time, I'm gonna move to, let's say, the, uh, um, this part of the, uh, of the talk, which is the, uh, um, let's say, my last paper, right? So uh, um, for people in RL, right, for people in RL, uh, it's becoming very popular RL these days, and, and, and this entire framework of Bayesian optimization can be applied to RL and maybe make RL a little bit more efficient, that efficient in problems like this. So I'll show you. I would like to uh, uh, you know, learn, this is Q-learning, right? And I would like to learn policies but in an environment where the reward function is very sparse. So it's a, what I call go only reward. So the reward is zero everywhere, except in the state, in one state, the state you wanna be at, or around that state. Can we use this framework, BO and space modeling and, 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 and you know, understanding uncertainty to actually devise a, 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 a a model, a, a RL model that 
is efficient and, and, and learns that uh, quickly. So here's the idea, right? Uh, um, uh, our, you know, before I show the, the ideas, that this is how much efficient we can get compared to you know, some Epsilon greedy uh, gradient. So our Q learning uh, 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 performance is, is, is like that compared to uh, uh, Epsilon greedy. But this is how we, we go about it, right? We take a Q function that is essentially a Bayesian linear regression on some space of kernels with the features that I described before. And we are modeling not only the function Q, but the uncertainty of that function Q. And when we do the Q learning, the conventional Q learning, we look at the function Q itself, the value, but also the uncertainty of Q to get data points where Q is more uncertain. And this can be done very nicely just embedding these features in there and having a linear regression model that borrows a lot of the properties of uh, GPs, but it's online. You can update this process very quickly and preserves the epistemic growth of uncertainty, as I described before. You know, uncertainty grows in that area. When you do this, okay, and this is actually uh, uh, the maximization step, where u is essentially a function of the uncertainty over q. You have behaviors that are much more uh, uh, kind of a, uh, you, you see now, I'm, I'm learning the mountain car thing, and with very few episodes, I get there. And I only receive positive rewards when I reach the, 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 the limit here. Because the model now understands that exploration, according to the uncertainty over Q, is as important as the uh, exploitation. Okay? And you can do that for uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, reaching problems like this with arms and, 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 and things like that as well. So if you are interested, check the, the, uh, the code is on GitHub. Check the, the Coral uh, publication. Uh, there are some challenges in here, particularly the, the dimensionality of, of the, the uh, uh, action space. At the moment, we can do four or five kind of uh, uh, action space, but this is way more data efficient than many of the deep learning inspired RL uh, method, right? So it's much more of a Bayesian thing. Okay, just to summarize, uh, uh, I mentioned that many problems like uh, uh, space time models can be seen as a Bayesian inference in a functional space, and we use Bayesian or the idea of prior and posteriors as a language to communicate with others in other disciplines. The source of uncertainty is absolutely critical for all of this. Uh, uh, Bayesian optimization can maximize processes, even pollution, functions that I cannot uh, uh, have an analytical form, but I can sample from, I can measure, even if they are in space and time. And we can extend this framework to even reinforcement learning ideas, as I show you there. My uh, email is right here, and I leave this video uh, on. That's, uh, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, this was 2007. Uh, it was 2007 when we started the automation. This is, uh, I think, 2014, where almost the entire mine is now autonomous. So BBC went there, did, some, uh, did, did a uh, documentary. You can check the papers and, uh, and look at uh, uh, these things. But now the trucks drive autonomously. But more than that, as you're going to see, the information fusion of the entire mining process is autonomous. And that's actually what is giving the payback to, to the company. That's actually the important bit. All the information the company collects is integrated and is used for planning the future. So it's an ongoing uh, interactive uh, uh, process. Okay, thank you very much. So the, the acquisition, well, the acquisition function essentially tries to balance uh, uh, the uncertainty with 
the maximum of that function and all possible relationships. So you can think of that in, 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 you know, in terms of quantiles uh, for the, 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 the uncertainty and so on. And that works well in the mathematical sense. So you have all the properties in there. For robotics, though, we can't just do that because robots have constraints. You can't just disappear for a moment and appear